Hey everybody, it's Matt. Welcome or welcome back to the Journey Church Podcast. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you can automatically get our weekly episodes. And you might want to go ahead and subscribe to our Journey YouTube channel as well. You'll find messages, music, interviews, inspiring stories, and more for you all right there. Now, I hope this episode helps you take your next step in following Jesus. All of us, it doesn't matter whether we're Christians or not Christians, all of us have what I would call a moral circle. And I want you to think about this for just a minute because our moral circle for many of us, um, it tends to be people we like and people who like us. It tends to be people we love uh, and people who love us. Our moral circle tends to be the folks that we're comfortable with, uh, the people who it's convenient to have in our lives. All of us tend to have one of these moral circles. Um, People that were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I care about those people deeply, or yep, I like those people a lot. They're within my circle. And then there are other people, and we don't think of it this way, but there are other people who tend to land outside of our circle, people who we don't like as much, people who uh, believe or behave differently than we do, people who, in some cases, we don't even know. And we're like, well, I don't know them. You know, they're they're living somewhere else, or I don't know them. I don't interact with them, so I'm not really too worried about them. Um, All of us tend to have people inside and outside of our moral circle. And here's what's odd about it, and you can process this for yourself. But whenever someone inside our moral circle doesn't live up to some standard, doesn't uh, meet some expectation, doesn't do what we would expect, how do we typically respond? Well, we respond to those people with grace. It's like, oh, it's okay. You know, they're having a hard day or they're having a hard week or they're going through a tough time. Don't be so hard on them. When people outside of our moral circle tend not to meet our expectations. We have a tendency not to respond with grace. We respond with judgment. We're a little harsher on them. I'll give you a really simple example. So if you go out to eat this afternoon and your waiter is someone who is a son or a daughter of a friend of yours and that waiter's having a tough day and they get your order wrong and they spill drinks all over the table and you know they just make a mess of the whole deal, how do you respond? Probably not too harshly, because again, there's son or daughter of somebody you care about. There's son or daughter of somebody in your moral circle. They may be in your moral circle. So it's like, no, 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 let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And you're all understanding and you give them, give them a tip, big tip at the end anyway. It's like, oh, okay, it's, it's fine, it's fine. But you flip that. What if you go out to eat this afternoon and a waiter does that that you don't know? Waiter does that who's not in your moral circle. How do you respond? Might be very differently. But why is that? Because that person is someone's son or daughter. That person has folks in their life who care about them deeply. So why would we respond in a different way to people in our moral circle versus outside? And what if, think about this, what if Jesus' moral circle was no bigger than your own? What if Jesus' moral circle was no bigger than yours, would you be in it? Would you even be here today and be a part of it? We're going to be wrapping up our series today. We've called Next Generation Church. And I want to wrap up with uh, a story from one of the accounts of Jesus' life. If you're not familiar, there are four gospels or accounts of his life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to look at a story from Matthew. Um, And this is a story I've never taught on before. It's a story that is extraordinarily confusing and quite honestly disturbing. It's one of those stories that if you read it, it causes you to scratch your head and go, I'm not sure I really like Jesus that much. That doesn't seem to be the kind of God I would want to follow. Um, It's also one of those stories, though. I just want you to think about this. It's also one of those stories that is another piece of evidence to cause you to go, These accounts of his life have to be reliable. They've got to be true. Because why would anybody make up something like this about Jesus and put it in there? And let me remind you, Matthew, who gives us this account, um, Matthew is one of Jesus' followers, one of his disciples. And what Matthew writes in his own account doesn't make Matthew or any of his friends look very good. So you're going to need a little context for this. I'm going to give it to you in a second. But we're going to drop right into the middle of the story. Here's what Matthew tells us happened. He was there. Matthew says, leaving that place, 
Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, let me give you the context right here so this makes sense. The place that Matthew is referring to that they left was a town called Capernaum. Capernaum was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee there in the northern part. And if you're not familiar with any of this context, uh, you may know from the Christmas story that Jesus' hometown was Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, family was from Nazareth. But when Jesus became an adult, he actually moved to this town of Capernaum right here. And he spent most of his ministry years based out of Capernaum. Capernaum was where many of his disciples had grown up and were from, like Peter and Andrew, James and John. They all grew up around Capernaum. So this was, this was home for them, okay? This was hometown. And Jesus decides to take his friends, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Matthew, Nathaniel, all these guys. He decides to take his friends and they walk 50 miles from Capernaum all the way up here to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Let me tell you a little bit about this region. This is a region of the Phoenicians. You guys remember the Phoenicians from school? Thank you for our alphabet, Phoenicians. You remember that? Okay, some of you do. Some of you slept through that. That's okay. You just learned something. Congratulations. So, so this is where the Phoenicians were from. from. It is uh, present-day Lebanon, okay? That's where it is. But in the time of Jesus in the first century, Jewish people didn't live up here. These were non-Jewish people. And to all the Jewish people who were with Jesus, the folks up here were impure and unclean, immoral and unclean. And what Jewish people meant by that was these were people who were so separated from God. They were not in the moral circle at all. They were not, Jewish people didn't believe these folks had any chance of being in God's moral circle. He just didn't care about them. And so these were folks that Jewish people wouldn't even walk in their homes, wouldn't sit down and have a meal with. They want nothing to do with it. That is the kind of people that Jesus takes his friends into their area. You can imagine the tension. These are people not like them. These are people that their mamas had said, no, 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 good Jewish boys don't hang out with people like that. That's who we're talking about, okay? But Jesus marches his friends right into that area, and Matthew tells us, then in spite of the fact that there's all this tension, in spite of the fact that these people who live up there know, oh, we're not in their moral circle, in spite of that, there is a woman from that area who decides she's going to go to this Jewish rabbi and she's going to make a request because she's in dire need of help. So here's what Matthew tells us takes place next. He says, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to Jesus crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Why do I need to have mercy? Well, because my daughter's demon possessed and suffering terribly. Now, if the demon possession thing weirds you out, we'll talk about that another day, okay? Don't, don't lose the plot line here. The plot line is you have a woman whose child is suffering. And the implication is she may have even brought that child with her to meet Jesus, okay? So she and her daughter are here. And you know, if you're a parent, if you're a parent, you know this, that you'll do anything for your child. So this woman, she has so much humility. She, she's willing to risk ridicule. She's willing to risk rejection. She knows it's against all the cultural norms for her to go to a Jewish man and ask for help. I mean, why would, why would they ever help somebody like her? Matter of fact, um, Jewish people called people like her dogs. That's how they referred to this whole people group up there. And it wasn't like in the sports term, he's a real dog, D-A-W-G. No, no, it was like, it's like the mutt, okay, the mutt. So it's like, no, 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 he, they wanted nothing to do. So you can imagine how much courage and boldness it took, this Canaan woman, to go to someone who she assumed viewed her so low. But that's what love for a kid will do. So she risks it all, rejection, humiliation, ridicule. She doesn't care. She goes to him and says, all right, Jesus, I think the daughter's right there, right? My daughter's suffering terribly. I've, I've done everything I can do. I've tried all the different things at our disposal. Nothing works. Would you please heal her? Now, whether you grew up in church or not, you're a Christian or not, what would you expect Jesus to do based on what you know about Jesus? Would you expect him to help the woman? I mean, he's helped hundreds, thousands of people before, done miracles, healed people. You just expect him to help the daughter, right? But Matthew tells us, that when he gets asked, Jesus did not answer a word. Just gave her the silent treatment. It's like he's ignoring her. Just goes on about his business. Well, the woman, she's not about to give up. So um, sometimes when I don't want to deal with what my kids want me to do, I just act like I don't hear them. That's bad parenting. But I don't care if I'm a bad parent. 
it gives them a good excuse to go to counseling when they're older. So, just kidding. And this woman apparently is like, he's just ignoring me. So she just keeps on and on and on. Like, help me, Jesus, help me. She just won't stop. And so Matthew tells us, remember, Matthew's one of the disciples, okay? The guy who's writing this is part of this group. Matthew tells us, so his disciples came to Jesus and urged him, would you please send her away for she keeps crying out after us. She is bothering us. I don't know why we're up here. I don't know why you brought us up here, but certainly not to hang out with people like that. And yet we can't get any peace and quiet. Jesus, would you please just send her away? And Jesus looks back at them and says, well, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, which sounds like he just said, well, my moral circle is only big enough for Jewish people anyway. She's not a Jewish person. She's not in my circle, so whatever. It just seems so calloused, so cold, so heartless. Well, this woman, she's hearing this entire thing, her and her daughter. And you got to love her humility because she's not going to give up. Matthew says, while all this is going on, when this conversation ends, the woman came and she knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, help me. Would you just, would you just put, look at my daughter? I know, I know you, you know, nobody here thinks I'm worth much, but would you just, for my daughter, do something? And Jesus looks back at her and says, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. That is what Jewish people call y'all, right? Dogs. Why would I take what's for Jewish people and give it to somebody as worthless as you? I don't know that anybody's ever read this as a bedtime story to their children. I would not advise it. It's like, what in the world? Well, you got to love this woman's persistence. Because Jesus says, no, 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 it's not right to do that. And the woman looks back at him and says, Oh, yeah, yes, it is. Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I'm not asking for a lot. I just want a little leftovers. You just give the main thing to the Jewish people. I just need a little leftover. That's all it takes to heal my daughter. And then Matthew says, Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Now, let's just be honest for a second. You read that story, and Jesus sounds racist, sexist, and heartless, doesn't he? And you wonder, what in the world? Not sure that's a God I want to follow. But as some of you might imagine, we are reading this story from the viewpoint of our 21st century understanding. And we're missing a few things from the first century context. Because the lesson Jesus was trying to teach that day was not a lesson to this woman. The lesson he was actually trying to teach that day was a lesson to his disciples. So let me go back and fill in some gaps for you, okay? You remember Jesus had taken his buddies, they had left Capernaum, they'd walked 50 miles to Tyre and Sidon. Well, just before they left Capernaum, and you can read this earlier in Matthew 15, just before they left Capernaum, Jesus got into a conflict with the religious leaders in Capernaum over whether they should follow some of their customs or not. So the Jews had all of these different customs that they followed, and they believed you had to follow these customs perfectly in order to remain in God's moral circle. So not even all Jews were included in God's circle from their point of view. Only the ones who could follow the law and keep all the customs. I'll give you a couple examples. One of the customs they were arguing over with Jesus was the fact that they said, Jesus, your disciples are not properly washing their hands before they eat. Sounds like an argument you'd have in kindergarten class, isn't it? It's like, what? But for the Jewish people, this is a big deal. So they're like, they're not washing their hands right before they eat, which means they're getting kicked out of God's moral circle. They're separated from God because they're not keeping the custom. And Jesus basically looked back at them and said, y'all have lost your mind. That's stupid. To which then they get into an argument over clean and unclean foods. Now, when you hear clean and unclean, you think healthy and unhealthy. That's not the way it worked back then. For Jewish people, clean and unclean foods meant this. There were certain foods they were allowed to eat. And if they ate those foods, they remained in God's moral circle. They were in God's good graces. If there were certain foods that they were not allowed to eat. And if they ate any of the unclean foods, 
the food they believed made them unclean. And the minute a Jewish person was unclean, they were out of God's moral circle. They were no longer allowed to be a part of it. So imagine that. Imagine this moral circle right here and imagine living your life thinking I've got to be careful what I eat or don't eat because it'll determine whether I'm in with God or out with God. Some of y'all might try that. You'd stick to your diet better if, if everything, you know, all that hung on it probably. But that, you know, that's what Jews believed. Oh man, I gotta, I, I can't eat anything unclean. So Jesus gets into an argument with the religious leaders about this because he says, that's not the way it is. It's not what goes into your mouth that determines whether you're in God's moral circle. It's what comes out of your mouth that determines where you stand with God. It's not what you eat, it's how you behave. And everything that's coming out of your mouth and every behavior that you have in your life is coming straight from your heart. So Jesus' point was, don't worry about what you eat. Just pay attention to your heart and make sure your heart's healthy and you'll be good with God. Well, we cannot understand how groundbreaking that was. It ticked the religious leaders off. It caused um, Jesus' friends, Peter and Andrew and Matthew and those guys to pull Jesus aside and say, what exactly do you mean by that? You know, what comes in doesn't matter. What goes out matters. And he says, well, exactly what I said. You can eat any food you want to eat. It's not going to determine whether you're in God's moral circle or not. You should eat whatever you want. He was, he was upending Jewish law that had been in place for centuries and trying to help them understand God's moral circle is way bigger than you believe it is. There are way more people God cares about than you think. And then, as soon as he's finished with this, he takes his friends and they walk 50 miles into the region of Tyre and Sidon where Jesus said, we're going to see if you've learned this lesson, guys. We're going to see if you can understand that not only does food not determine whether you're in God's moral circle, but the people you interact with don't either. We're going to see if you learn this lesson and understand that God's moral circle is big enough to include everybody. And he walks them right into a region with a group of people where they believe, if I eat with them, if I go to their house, if I engage with them, I'm unclean. And it's in that environment, in that context, that this woman comes up and ask Jesus for help. So when Matthew tells us Jesus didn't say a word to her, he wasn't giving her the silent treatment. Jesus was sitting back looking at his friends going, have y'all figured it out yet? He wanted to see what they had to say. He wanted to see if they had finally come to realize based on what he taught them that God cares about that woman just as much as he cared about them. And do you remember what happened? They flunked the test. That's what happened. They look back at Jesus and they're saying, oh, yeah, the unclean, clean, uh, we got it now, we got it. Instead of that, they said, no, 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 would you just please send her away for she keeps crying out after us. We don't care about this woman. She's not in our moral circle. And so when Jesus looks back and says, hey, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel, he wasn't saying my moral circle is only for Jewish people. He was saying, you guys still don't get it. You think my moral circle is only for people like you. It's not. So you remember he then looks at the woman because she keeps begging and pleading and he looks at her and says, it's not right. Take children as bread and toss it to the dogs. Sounds so harsh. Actually, it wasn't harsh because the word Jesus used when he said dogs was not the word that all of his Jewish friends would use as a word of scorn and ridicule and derision towards these people. The word that Jesus used is actually a word that meant a beloved pet, a puppy. Now, I don't understand you dog people and how much you love folks, so I'm not even going to get into that. But y'all love your dogs more than people sometimes. So you can understand this, okay? If you came up to me and said, Matt, I love you like my dog, I would assume that was a compliment, all right? So the woman understands this. The minute Jesus says this to her, she knows he used a different word. And it confirms everything she had believed about Jesus, that his moral circle was way bigger than people thought it was. So that's why she looks back at him and says, oh, it is, it is right, Jesus. It's okay to, you know, let the dogs eat scraps from the kid's table. This is just her being playful back with him. Because she knew, she knew. Jesus had just confirmed that his moral circle was big enough to include people 
that no Jewish person would ever include. And then he healed her daughter. So, here's where this gets personal for us. The question I would invite you to consider is this. Which one are you more like? Which one are you more like? Whose moral circle do you tend to have? Is your moral circle a little bit more like the disciples? It's full of people like you and people you like, full of people you love and people who love you, full of people who are similar to you, people from your community, your neighborhood, people you run with. But when you encounter people in other places and other parts, people who don't believe or behave like you, they're not included. You just don't really care. When you think about people in our communities or in other communities who don't have a relationship with Jesus, if, if you're a Jesus follower, does it even matter to you? You're like, no, I'm just making sure my folks, I just want to make sure everybody you know, impacts me, my family, my friends. Okay, we're good. Is that all you care about? It's a pretty small moral circle. Or is your moral circle a little bit more like Jesus? Because one of the things he did when he showed up on this earth is he taught and demonstrated that his moral circle is as big as our planet, that everybody's invited, everybody's included, everybody's important. Everybody matters to God, whether God matters to them or not. Which means, as I shared with you last week, in our community, there are 1,500 high school students who aren't in church on any given week. About 143,000 people in general in our communities we come from who aren't in church on any given week. And Jesus' moral circle is big enough to include them. Jesus' moral circle is big enough. And he says, no, 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 we got to make it simple for all those people to be able to connect with me. Is your moral circle that big? Is mine? Do we really care that much? Or is it, let's just make sure everybody who would impact my life is taken care of. Which is it? If you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't consider yourself a church person. The thing I hope you walk away with today is that your heavenly father's moral circle includes you. And you may have been told the opposite. And you may find that hard to believe. But Jesus gave his life on a cross and rose again to prove that's true for you. For those of us who follow Jesus, the question is, are we willing to widen our circle as big as Jesus is? Are we willing to widen our circle for the next generation? So if you're not a part of Journey, you don't consider this your church, you kind of get to sit on the sidelines for the end here. But for those of us who call this our church, you know, last week I was telling you over the last two years what God's done through you is pretty remarkable. I mean, doubled in size, impacting a whole lot more people. But if you've been around here, you know, we, we don't publicly or even behind the scenes, we don't spend our time talking about the numbers of people who are here. We spend our time thinking about the numbers of people who are not here, the 143,000 who aren't in church in our communities, all the high schoolers who aren't connected anywhere. We spend our time thinking about them because can you imagine what it would be like to go through life and not know that God loves you, that he's for you, that he's on your side, to not have the hope and the peace that he provides. And so that's who we try to think about and that's who we try to talk about. And we're at a point now where on that side of the building, we've run out of space. And so last week I told you we've got an opportunity, if we want to, to add another 3,600 square feet on that's going to allow us to serve a little over 100 high schoolers, a little over 100 6th through 8th graders, and about 200 K through 5th graders, close to it, uh, to create more space for people who, let's just be honest, they're not in our circle in the sense of they're, they're not here. We may not even know them. And I feel like it's a pivotal crossroads for our church. And I'll tell you why, because for 18 years, we have we've not gotten it right all the time, but we've tried to be so focused on being for people who aren't yet here, of making sure we're willing to do whatever it takes to make it simple for people that we may not even know yet to meet and follow Jesus. 
And the reality is now we're at a point where many of us could say we're good. We're good. Because all the people in my circle, you know, they're here. All the people in my circle, they're good. All, all the, pe- the kids and students in my circle, they're connected. They're good. We're good. And now we have to decide, are we going to be the kind of church that settles for what's comfy and convenient? The kind of church that keeps their moral circle small? Or are we willing to do what it takes to widen our moral circle to be as big as Jesus is, is, even though that inconveniences us? To me, that's what this space is about. It's are we willing to do something for people who aren't even here yet that we may not even know? And it's, it's not a small thing to do. I told you last week, this space is going to cost somewhere between $1.2, $1.3 million, which if that takes your breath away and just sounds stupid, I'll, I'll give you a little context. We built this building two years ago for $168 a square foot, and commercial buildings are now three to $400 a square foot. So that is stupid. That's what that is. Unfortunately, they didn't come ask me about that because I told the contractor, I think that's stupid. And he said, yeah, me too, but I'm not changing it. So, you know, because it's just what it costs now, and it's probably not going to get cheaper. The odds are greater it's going to go up than go down over the next five years. So it's not an insignificant sum of money, but it's not really about the money, is it? It's about whether we're willing to widen our moral circle. And say, no, 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 we're, we're going to create a place for people we don't even know to connect with Jesus. So this week I gave you, or last week I gave you this question. Um, how much extra would you be willing to give for the next 12 months to make this happen? Because you get to decide. I mean, my wife and I, we've already decided we're in. We know our answer to this question, but you get to decide whether we do it or not. Because it'll take all of us working together to make that happen. And so... Um, if this is new for you, all this information is on our app. It's at uh, journeycalway.com slash build. You can find all the info on there. And you can find a place where you can give us how much um, extra you'd be willing to give. And so we're keeping it real simple. Just think about what you gave in 2023. How much extra would you give in the next 12 months? Just tell us that amount. There's a form on both of these places you can go. There's a simple little form you can tell us how much because we're going to look at all that by the end of March and we're going to decide, can we afford to do this or not? So that's how we'll make the decision. Now, on March 24th, um, I told you, hopefully you'll have your commitment in by then. That's when we need to know it by. And then uh, we'll take every dollar that's given in the offering that day and we'll use it for this project. Now, somebody asked me, it's a great question. They're like, what if we give money on this day And then you get to the end of March, 1st of April, and you're looking at what people are willing to give, and we don't have enough to build it. And here was my answer. We'll just give you all your money back. You heard that right. We can do that. It's really not that hard. We'll just refund. I shouldn't have told you that. Because now you're going to be asking for refunds off of bad sermons, and that'll be every week. So anyway, that'll be for the admin people to figure out. But yeah, we can refund you all your money, and that's exactly what we'll do. We'll just refund you all your money. Um, But by the 1st of April, we'll be figuring out do we have enough? So if you want to be a part of this, um, open up our app, scan the QR code, go to the site, however you want to do it, and let us know how much extra, because we're making decisions based off of that. If you don't tell us, we don't know. I can't read your mind. So we'll make decisions based off of whatever you tell us. Now, real quick, before I wrap up, let me say this. Widening our circle isn't just about giving. Widening our circle is also about serving. And a lot of you are new here, and that's, we love it. That's awesome. And you have yet to get involved here. And I want to ask you to do more than give. I want to ask you to be willing to get involved and serve here. So that Because if we build this space and we double how many kids and students we have over there, it means we have to have more volunteers who are investing in those kids and students every week. So I want to ask you to consider giving a little bit of your time to make a lifetime of difference in some kids or students or adults. A little bit of your time on Sunday morning, and I guess this is a bit of breaking news, but come summer, we're moving our high school, which is on Wednesday nights right now, we're moving it to Sunday nights because it's a better time for, for students. So everything will be happening on Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night. But I want to encourage you to consider giving a little bit of your time to do that. And if you're interested in that, you want to learn more, all you have to do is go to our app, scan the QR code, 
and check out Serve Now. Serve Now is where you go. It's a no obligation environment. It's where you go to learn ways you can make a difference here, ways you could get involved to get all your questions answered and find a place that you could try. And so I want to ask you to do that. Let me tell you why I want to ask you. Because you don't want us to ever become a consumer-centered church. You do not want us, even if you don't give or serve here, you actually don't want the majority of people at this church to be people who don't give and serve. Because if we ever become a group of people who are primarily consumers, I've taken care of my little circle, it's all good, I'm not worried about anything else, this will actually become a church you don't like to attend. And if I'm being honest, it'll be a church I don't want to pastor anymore. Because that's not what any of us enjoy about this. What brought you here was the fact that there's a group of people here who care so much, they're willing to do whatever it ta takes to serve people and reach people who they don't even know in our communities. That's why you're here. That they're willing to give, they're willing to serve with no strings attached. That's why you love this place. You experience it every Sunday when you come in, when these volunteers create extraordinary experiences for you, for kids, for students. You don't want to go to a church that's not like that. But if you don't give and serve, you're going to make this a church that's not like that. And then you won't like it, and you'll leave. And I won't like it, and I'll leave. And they'll figure out something else to do with this building, I guess. I don't know. Because that's not what any of us signed up for. So I want to invite you, just find a serve now. We do a couple of them a month typically. Find a serve now through the app, sign up for it, just check it out. Give a little bit of your time to make a difference in the lives of kids, of students, of adults. You have no idea how God could use you to impact their lives. Because listen, you want the next generation to grow up and be a group of people who have a huge moral circle. You want the next generation to grow up and be people who are willing to give and serve to care about others, even people who aren't like them. But the next generation will grow up and do what they see you doing, not what you tell them to do. So if you're not willing to serve and give other people to, to other people to serve other people, they're not going to do it. But if they grow up watching you do it, they'll think it's normal to do. They won't know any different. And their life will be exponentially better because of it. For those of us who are Christians, our leader said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life. We can't follow Jesus if we're coming to be served every week. You're following Jesus when you serve and give. Not just a little group in your moral circle that are like you and that you like, but to Jesus' moral circle, which encompasses the entire planet. Everybody matters to God, whether God matters to them or not. The question is how much he matters to us. And over the next few weeks, we're going to find out how much they matter to you and me. Let's pray together. Father, it's just our nature to go to what's comfortable, convenient, and easy to focus on ourselves. We get that. But for those of us who follow you would, you, would you push us out of that? Would you help us to, to have a love and a care for people who are not like us, who maybe we don't even know, maybe we'll never even meet and they'll benefit us in no way. But would you help us to care as much as you do about making it simple for people to connect with you? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you'd like more content like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and download our Journey app to access all of our recent message content. And our app is the easiest way to share this content with friends. For more information on our church or to find our app or our YouTube channel, just visit journeycalway.com. That's journeycalway.com. Thanks for listening.